Well, thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you all. Um, this is the, the warm-up act for the NSF presentation to follow. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about just some USGS perspectives on EarthScope, both uh, over its history and as, uh, as we look into the future. Um, the, I am from the Earthquake Hazards Program Office in Reston. I'm Associate Coordinator. I spent 14 years in Menlo Park um, during the time that EarthScope was being conceived, developed, and, and deployed. Um, uh, so I was there from 89 to 2003, which was a very active time in, in this community, of course. Um, and the USGS really has been involved as an active collaborator um, with NSF and with the academic community throughout EarthScope. And we're very pleased uh, that we have been, and we're very pleased with the results that have, that have emerged so far and continue to roll out. Um, let me talk just briefly about the three components. I'll talk first about SAFI because it was, it was very much in my face when I was at USGS. Um, so when, when SAFOD, SAFOD came out of an idea for deep uh, fault zone drilling that was the brainchild really of Steve Hickman and Mark Zoback. And Steve, Steve and I shared an office at USGS during the time that this was being discussed. And so I was the recipient of the, of the back noise of about 14,000 phone calls um, between USGS and Stanford as they put that together. Um, but as, as the, the thoughts for a fault zone observatory developed, it was at the same time that the EarthScope uh, idea was developing, and, and so the, the two were coupled together. And in fact, Steve and Mark were, were very much uh, involved in putting together the early documentation um, proposal for EarthScope. Um, er, uh, SAFOD has been a very challenging experiment, but a very, very successful one. Um, the, the fault zone did, in fact, penetrate the San Andreas Fault. Core was brought to the surface, as, as Heather uh, uh, explained uh, very nicely before. Um, so there was a program of drilling, of sample recovery, uh, anal analysis of fluids, an incredible set of logs, um, cores that are still being analyzed. And uh, thus far, I believe there's over 100 scientific peer review papers that have come out of SAFOD, and they continue to come out at a rapid clip. Um, and some of the great big, uh, big hypotheses going in that were driving the, the idea of fault zone drilling um, have been answered or at least begun to be addressed. Um, one of them uh, was, the, was the weak fault hypothesis. Uh, we now know that the fault zone has these shear zones with extremely weak material, these mag magnesium rich smectites that at least in the upper kilometers have a very low friction coefficient. One little hitch to the story is those are not necessarily stable below perhaps five kilometers in a fault zone, which calls into question what are the processes deeper on a fault that are responsible for its weakness continuing on down, uh, down into the lower crust, which it would need to, need to be weak in order to have the heat flow and, and stress uh, orientations and so forth. So there's more to be learned there. And then the other key question about safe, that SAFOD attempted to, to identify was, what's different about those little repeating earthquake asperities? You know, the, the, the final phase of the experiment did not actually come to pass, which was to also drill through a magnitude two earthquake source, repeating earthquake source. What's different about the fault there? Why does it lock up and have earthquakes? What happens during those earthquakes and so forth? Perhaps one of the things we can do with this marvelous 40, $45 million uh, observatory that we've constructed in California is to say, do we want to, now that we have such a characterization of the, of the slipping fault, we want to take a look at an earthquake patch as well, and that could be fascinating, and complete the original, um, the original concept of SAFOD. Right now, there, things are a little bit in limbo with, uh, with respect to management for SAFOD. Um, uh, Greg is working with the community to, to develop what sort of a management do we want a structure for both the facility itself and for the core, and we hope that that moves along um, rapidly. So. Um, in terms of PBO, another fantastic success. Uh, again, the, some of the design for PBO came out of the sign network that the USGS was a heavy participant in in Southern California. Um, now has emerged as a velocity field for the plate boundary zone, both in the strike slip environment and in the cascade environment. Um, and then there's been a great evolution of that GPS network beyond its original conception as well, as the stimulus funds uh, and community uh, interest led to 
real-time and high-rate GPS monitoring, which of course is expanding the possibilities for the use of GPS greatly. We now have uh, GPS facilities, or the GPS monitoring of our active fault zones, the subduction zone, and of about a 10 or more um, active volcanoes. Uh, and so these have become incredibly important monitoring facilities as well as the scientific observation facilities that really drove the concept of EarthScope to begin with. In addition, um, we have the borehole strain program. Uh, Duncan talked quite a bit about that. Um, that is a program that's still, uh, still developing, I would say. Uh, the, 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 the strain meters are incredibly, incredible instruments. They have incredible sensitivity. The data are hard to work with. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of coupling of the behavior of the borehole, the behavior of the surroundings, and the strain field it's trying to observe. And so I think there's a real opportunity for more community involvement in learning how to work with those data, developing data streams that can be more accessible for those outside of the, the, the small strain meter science field, um, and perhaps integration of um, high rate strain data in with GPS, in with seismic, into active monitoring of rapid processes. Going along with PBO were, were also more surface-based uh, things uh, that came along. Um, there was LIDAR, B4 LIDAR, um, very uh, high-resolution LIDAR, and then a whole fault trenching program that uh, sort of the, the fault trenching community added themselves onto EarthScope um, in, in order to uh, take advantage of that big community interest in in the plate boundary. US Array, of course, is, um, I, I'm not going to say much about that, but it's, people talk about bold. I, I talk about chutzpah. Um, the idea that you could put in this many seismic stations over a nation is just amazing. And uh, whether you talk about it rolling or crawling or marching across the country, it's been amazing to watch. Um, I think we're going to see some very exciting results coming out of, of what just, it just crawled across the whole central US. What is it that's special about the New Madrid seismic zone, the most active seismic area, highest hazard area east of the, of the Rockies? And uh, what is different about that zone versus north or south versus east or west? Um, hopefully, we'll learn something about that, because that's been one of our big questions in, in certainly the, the hazard realm for quite some time. Um, looking ahead, we've also got the, the science of, of, that was highlighted by the Virginia earthquake, the tectonics of the eastern U.S., and what are, the, what are the kinds of forces that are driving these old, very old faults that occasionally give us these very damaging earthquakes in the east. That'll be fascinating to find out more about that um, from, from the uh, transportal array. And then finally, on the TA, we have the opportunity, of course, for the station adoption. This is going to be a very lasting legacy of EarthScope, um, one of many. But um, the, the more to which these stations can be adopted in the central and eastern US, adding to the capability of monitoring, uh, driving our monitoring um, thresholds down greatly, improving our accuracy of science, seismic source characterization, that's going to be terrific. Both NSF and USGS are, are working with, with uh, OMB and Congress to try to attract some money to our budgets for both this conversion of the stations on the part of, of NSF and the maintenance and operation of those stations long term from the point of view of USGS. Um, that's a challenging thing to do in this uh, funding environment, but we're, we're hopeful. Um, just to wrap up, I, I just wanted to reflect a little bit the, on these observation programs, these platforms. These are really terrific. They're unprecedented in this country. Um, as you've seen in talk after talk this morning, the concepts that, were, that drove the development of the EarthScope plan, the EarthScope proposal, were deep crust, upper mantle, broad scale, um, trying to get some more grain into things that were previously visible only in broad scale. However, every single one of those platforms has had great importance, shallow, up to the crust, even in some cases up to the atmosphere. Um, and this, this, frankly, is the world in which I live. Um, the USGS, most of our interest is to the, for the nation is in mining, hazards, uh, water, and so forth. And so these platforms have become increasingly important for societal problems that are immediate and ongoing. Water availability, um, induced seismicity, hazards of earthquakes, hazards of volcanoes, active faulting, and of course the great big subduction zone, our Tohoku, our Sumatra, 
that is sitting in the Pacific Northwest and just calling for us to, for, to better understand it. Um, this brings us a challenge, of course, in that this was conceived of as an experiment, an observational program. This is what NSF does. We do, they do observational programs, but of a fixed lifetime. The USGS does monitoring, which is basically an investment of instrumentation and observations for the long haul. Um, we have a difficult period of time coming up now with this incredible investment that's been made in seismic GPS strain um, and so forth and so on. How do we transform these into uh, instruments that can continue to serve the nation um, long term since the nation's made this $200 million investment um, that's turned out to be you know, scads higher in value across so many different fields? How can we make that continue? And then looking into the future, if we look at the next big thing, the Earth science community has learned about doing big science through EarthScope. You know, the astronomers figured it out, the particle guys figured it out. We've now figured it out to a great extent. Um, NSF has learned how to manage this, this style of program. The, the community has just learned how to work together. I hope that when we think about what are the next big things going into the future that we can think very broadly anticipate that whatever the instrumentation we may put in in the next big thing is going to have uses beyond which we can conceive um, and, and anticipate that and think fully through. If that turns out to be the case, how can we make them continue? Can we, should we be thinking beyond NSF? Should we be thinking federal government wide across several science agencies? What should be the, the, the long-term plan for uh, for things that, that turn out to be excellent long-term investments. So um, I'm looking forward to the next big things uh, discussions. Those should be fascinating. Um, as I said, we have a, a particular interest in the subduction zone because uh, I think we're all pretty worried that, um, that either in Alaska or Cascadia, we may be having something bad come along in our lifetimes, and we certainly want to be prepared as possible for that. Uh, and I appreciate, again, the chance to talk with you. Thanks. Thank you.